Okay. Uh, the numbers have slowed down a little bit, so I think I'm going to move forward and start. Great. So first of all, welcome everybody to our webinar on the growth mindset, which is presented by Dr. Tracy Myers, and we're really pleased that you can join us today. My name is Amy Levine, and I will be your host. I'm the Director of Programs and Volunteers, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're we're unfamiliar with Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers. We are a nonprofit organization serving the Massachusetts legal community with mental health and substance misuse challenges. We offer one-on-one -on -one consultations with licensed clinicians, peer support groups, as well as customized programs. We also do one-on-one -on -one consults on law office practice management. I will introduce Dr. Tracy Myers in just one moment, but I do want to remind people that we will be at answering questions at the end of the presentation, and you can use either the chat or the Q&A function. And without further ado, let me present Dr. Tracy Myers. Uh, she is a licensed clinician here at Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, where she meets with lawyers, judges, and law school students for assessment and evaluation of mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, she also facilitates groups for lawyers on well being, presents on well being and mental health topics for the entire Massachusetts legal community. And prior to joining LCL, she worked as a clinical neuropsychologist and was the Director of Behavioral Intervention for Inpatient Services. She has authored several publications around integrative medicine and positive behavioral support treatment for mental health challenges. And without further ado, I am gonna hand it over to Dr. Myers. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Thanks everyone for coming today. I'm excited to present on this topic around mindset and specifically growth mindset and stress. So I'm gonna share my screen. And again, okay. All right. So the title is Growth Mindset, Rethinking Our Relationship to Stress. So we'll be talking today about how stress can be seen in different ways, depending on our mindset. And then really kind of drilling down into what is mindset, including this idea of a fixed and then a more flexible approach. And then I will be guiding you into some strategies to create a more resilient mindset. What are some ways to manage particularly stress? Stress will sort of be our, our model today, but mindset can apply to many different things. How we can use a flexible mindset um, to help us navigate stress. Before Amy and I started today, we were both sharing like situations where um, when stress is involved, how a, having a flexible mindset can be really helpful. Right. So I often like to start a practice, a program, especially when we're going to talk about stress with a little bit of grounding. So we're going to just take about a minute to do a gentle, what we call soft landing. Um, and see if we can begin to settle ourselves. So if you'd like, maybe even closing the eyes for a moment. Just taking a couple of breaths. Settling in. Perhaps scanning the body and noticing if you're holding any stress in the body. Perhaps relaxing the shoulders, the head neck, the hands. Relaxing the legs. Feeling the feet on the floor. And checking in with your breath. Just noticing how's your breath today? Is it relaxed and slow? Is it a little anxious and short? Just taking a few rounds of 
gentle breath, just noticing without changing anything, how you're doing and how your breath is. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back. So we're often carrying stress, right? Without even really being consciously aware of it. So today I'll be highlighting and we'll be doing a couple of experiential exercises well, where we'll tap in to stress. And so know at any point, this reminder to come back to the breath, to the sensations in the body can be helpful when navigating stress, because even thinking about st something stressful can create a physiological response in the body. All right, so what is stress? And it's such a broad term, right? And it can really mean something completely different um, to one person versus another. It can be mild, like we have too many commitments today, right? And we can't get them all done, or it could be severe. Um, it could be something that's a high impact, stressful event. Think about the hurricane in Florida, right? Something that's really stressful. Um, something like facing an illness or a loss of a job, right? So we've got lots of different potential stressors, right? And so we're going to dive into this a little bit further. But one thing I want to say today is that some of the things that are high impact stressful events, this is not necessarily where we're gonna start in terms of using um, a flexible approach. It would be great if we could, but this is not the um, sort of medicine for that. What we're gonna be talking about today, and especially as we're working on some exercises is more mild to moderate levels of stress because certainly things like a hurricane or an illness, you know, we're, we're not gonna be able to just easily um, create a new relationship. So I just want to honor that stresses can be very difficult. And I don't want to oversimplify or make it seem like, oh, just change how you're thinking and the stress will melt away. I really want to honor the levels of stress that people experienced and knowing that all stresses are not alike. And we'll come back to that at the end, but I just really want to say that there are times where this approach may not really be, be helpful. So when we think about stressors, there are three sort of categories and there are others too, but kind of three categories that I like to think about. One is conflict, like stressors come when there's a conflict from what we have and what we want to be different, right? We don't, we you know, might want something to be different than it is and this is what we have right now. We want a different um, boss. <laughs> we want a different workload. We want a different computer system, right? So those are things that could be a stressor. And then this is a big one for many of us, which is uncertainty, when we don't know what's gonna happen, right? And so anticipatory anxiety or uncertainty about the future off, often creates stress. And then pressure, as many lawyers well recognize when we need to be faster, quicker, deadlines looming, right? So these are three typical ones we encounter in the workplace, right? We don't know what's gonna happen in the future, there's pressure, and then there may be a conflict between what we have and what we wish to be different. And that doesn't even get into our personal lives, right? So stress is, is all around us. So what is stress, this ubiquitous term, right? We do know that it's often portrayed negatively, right? It's been ca ca called a, a growing plague, an epidemic. Um, it's been linked to causes of death, including heart disease, Think about the 1970s where the type A personality came out and this idea that, that when people are type A personality under stress, they're more likely to have cardiac issues, right? And now we can add in cancer, liver disease, lung ailments, suicide, absenteeism, increased medical spent expenses, loss of productivity, cognitive impairment, depression, mental health, aggression, and a lot of relational um, discord. So stress can have, of course, a negative impact on our well-being and our work performance. So when did stress sort of become part of our vernacular and become part of this sort of plight that so many of us are struggling with? So in psychology, we, we look back to Walter Cannon in the 1930s because he was credited with this idea of a stress response. 
and that he really made this connection between the body and the mind. Before that, there was an, you know, of course people understood there was stress, but he really pinpointed and helped to um, identify what was happening in the body when there was stress in the system. So he coined the term fight or flight. Many of you are familiar with this, this term fight or flight, which occurs when a person is experiencing stress, a, an arousal of the sympathetic nervous system. We know now that fight or flight also has hormonal components to it, like cortisol and adrenaline. And essentially it can create a whole system of stress from our breath to our hearing, our sight, our lungs. And you can see in this diagram, digestion, hands, bladder, right? All these things when we're under stress can get impacted. So about 20 years later, Han Seeley was credited with looking at the hormonal piece as well. And he created something called the general adaptation syndrome theory. So he looked at both the physiological, hormonal and neural impact stress. And his research led to more of that type A personality research in the 1970s, really looking at how long-term stress can damage different physiological systems in the body, different organ systems. Um, heart, digestion, immune system, and kidneys. He talked about um, different reactions and stages of the GAS, an alarm reaction, that fight or flight feeling, then resistance development. So this is, we're gonna get into this kind of second part today a little bit, um, that increased capacity to adapt to stress can actually be helpful, but too much stress can cause exhaustion, prolonged, intolerable stress, particularly, which we might say to, in today's language, trauma, can produce a breakdown physiologically, fatigue-wise, and with mental health. So Seeley had this more global view, and I would say holistic view of what stress does, and also starts to give us a, a clue that there could be a positive aspect of stress as well. So stress response, Typically, we're thinking about adrenaline and dopamine that get secreted once the brain has identified that there's a stressor, right? And then um, there is a particular pathway that the cortisol goes to those different organ systems so that the body mobilizes, just like here, the zebra is getting chased by the lion, right? So we want to be able to fight or, or flee. The brain also changes under stress. When we're under stress, the part of the brain that helps us to think, plan, problem solve, reason, and be flexible kind of starts to shut down. And we end up really being guided by our threat center of the brain, the amygdala and the hippocampus. When that threat detection system turns on, it's like we have tunnel vision. And often the feeling of, I want this to end, how do I get out of the situation? Or what ways can I avoid the situation so that nothing bad happens? Um, and essentially the system and our brain functioning changes from being fully um, aware, alert, being able to problem solve to much more of escape avoidance and let's uh, get out of here, right? So stress can impact the brain as well. So the typical views of stress are that stress is negative and we need to avoid, manage, and counteract the effects of stress. Think about the term stress management. It's like, all right, we wanna manage stress because it's not good. How do, we, how do we reduce it? And when I'm speaking to lawyers like that, it, it, it doesn't really land to say, well, you just gotta reduce your stress. It'd be great if we could do that. But as we saw in the, in the earlier slide, Stress relates to not only what's happening now, but even anticipatory, um, futurizing. And so it's really hard to try to avoid it. In fact, it can feel dismissive to say, just reduce your stress. So these typical views of stress don't give us a lot of pathways, especially in very stressful lives. So is there another way to think about stress? So we're gonna talk about this idea and starting to float this hypothesis that some stress could be good for you. I'm gonna show you a couple of video clips. Kelly McGonigal 
has written a book called The Upside of Stress. So I'm going to stop sharing and just switch my um, video to show us. All right, I'm gonna to listen to Kelly. Hopefully the technology works. Most people believe that there is one way that the body responds to stress. You know, everyone's heard the fight or flight response, but it actually turns out that that's just one way that the body and brain can respond to a stressful circumstance. Uh, and it's often not a very helpful way to respond to a stressful circumstance, especially one in which you really want to rise to the challenge and perform your best, where it's really not about survival mode. And it turns out that the brain and the body actually has another way of responding to these kind of high stakes challenges, you know, whether it's an important negotiation or you have to give a speech or an athletic competition, those moments where you really want to show up and do your best. And that other way of responding to stress is called a challenge response, that it's uh, a way for your brain and body to give you maximum focus, attention and energy. And it's physically different than the sort of the fight or flight response that we have when we feel deeply threatened by a stressful situation. When you have a threat response, you know, your body and brain are shifting into the state that is really the sort of the classic association with the harmful stress response. It's gonna make you more likely to choke under pressure. It's gonna feel more like dread or overwhelm. When you have a challenge response, uh, the brain and body actually shift into a state that gives you more access to your resources. You know, your heart might still be pounding, but your blood vessels are going to relax and open up so you get more blood flow to your muscles and to your brain. Your brain shifts into a state, it's actually better at paying attention to everything in your environment rather than sort of being laser focused like you might be in a fight or flight response on what's going wrong or what's, you know, what's dangerous. When you have a challenge response, all of your senses open to all the information that's available to you, which means you're basically smarter under stress. Um, and researchers have gotten really interested in figuring out how do you get people to shift from a threat response into a challenge response? Because unless your life is on the line in some sort of crazy emergency situation, it's going to be better for you to have a challenge response than a threat response. You'll perform better. And that's been shown in situations ranging from people performing surgery to athletes on the field to students taking difficult exams, um, that when you have a challenge response, you just do better. And it seems like one of the best ways to shift from a threat response to a challenge response is actually to view your own stress response as a resource. You know, the reason that many people have a threat response in a stressful situation is that the very first signs of anxiety, when they notice some sweat on their brow or they're starting to feel their heart pound, they think, uh-oh, I'm about to blow it. And they turn their attention to trying to calm down or trying to suppress whatever stress is arising. And uh, research originally coming out of Harvard University um, has shown that when people say, okay, I'm stressed out, I feel stress happening right now. And that's a resource. That stress can actually help me do better. It actually changes the physiology of the stress response from threat to challenge. And it helps people perform better, whether they're giving a talk in public whether they are engaging in a business negotiation, whether they're a student taking an exam, across many scenarios, literally just embracing your own stress, energy, arousal, or anxiety uh, can transform what's happening in your brain and body to really help you rise to the challenge. Right. So that was just a little preview of what we're gonna dive into now. So as you can see, there are other ways, right? It, as, as Kelly is sharing about how we view stress. So we're gonna get into this piece now. So if we start to believe and understand that stress is, isn't just negative to be avoided, the research shows that stress can actually enhance performance and productivity. There's research showing that we process information more effectively when there's stress. It can improve memory we actually are paying attention and able to consolidate information more effectively under challenge stress and focus, and it can help us focus attention. So again, we're not talking about the hurricane level of stress. We're talking about mild to moderate stress that we're able to see 
as a challenge rather than overwhelm. So stress can help with performance and productivity. It all often is often a helper in terms of health and vitality. So we think about exercise, we think about late weightlifting, right? Where we sometimes break down tissue to build more strength. We know that vaccinations sometimes create a stress response in the body where it, it can enhance immunity. So moderate stress can help us actually recover more quickly. And over time, um, these stress hormones actually can induce a set of growth hormones, which rebuild cells, synthesize proteins, enhance immunity. And some researchers call this effect physiological thriving. So it's sort of the opposite of what we think about. We think about stress causing us to feel like we're failing. Um, and here, the health information especially shows that stress can cause thriving. And even knowing that can help us moderate our response to stress. So we'll get into a little bit more of the thinking process in a moment. Finally, stress can facilitate learning and growth. It can create mental toughness. It can create deeper relationships when we're able to work as a team to get through something stressful and even a greater appreciation for life, right? When we're working, um, you know, with, with people that have gone through health crises and challenges, they'll often say, well, you know, this was, this was a terrible, but I also learned to cherish certain things. So we have research showing that um, people actually can feel stronger mentally and physically as a result of stress. Even in traumatic situations, researchers call this post-traumatic growth, and it's that acquisition of a mental toughness um, appreciation, sense of meaning, strength and priorities that can develop um, even under really difficult situations. All right, so how do we distinguish that? What helps us to get to this sort of optimal use of stress? So here we have in the hopper our three major categories of stress, conflict, uncertainty, and pressure. For many of us, it can lead to panic and performance anxiety, depression, stress-related illness, or it could lead to motivation and peak performance, stress-related growth, thriving. So what distinguishes that? So consider that it might be how we think. And that is going to lead into the part two, which is mindset. All right, so when I talk about mindset, I wanna go back to the brain briefly because mindset does involve the brain. The word mind kind of implies that. So you can see there are four lobes of the brain and particularly when we're considering mindset, we're talking about the frontal lobe. If you remember earlier on, I showed you the slide with stress in the brain and how the frontal lobes, particularly the prefrontal cortex gets sort of down switched or lowered. Um, like almost offline when we have a lot of stress. And yet mindset and our capacity to be flexible in our mindset re involves that frontal lobe. So we want to really recruit the frontal lobes to help us with um, our ability to have a more flexible approach. So the frontal lobe helps us with our thinking, our memory, reasoning, social expectations, planning, and abstract thinking. And it also includes something called cognitive flexibility. And I just found this slide, I just I like this description because it's a sort of where we want to think about cognitive flexibility, the ability to change tasks, adjust to change demands, change priorities, and change perspectives. So if we go back to stress, we're inviting all of us today to think about stress in a more cognitively flexible way. Stress as bad, negative, harmful, can we shift that to sometimes view stress as a resource? So cognitive flexibility, this ability to swiftly transition between tasks, adapt to new information, create ideas, it's crucial for problem solving, and it helps us to adapt, right? So cognitive flexibility is a skill we can, we can really build into. So mindset gives us this um, rubric to kind of look at. 
a framework to, to examine how do we create more cognitive flexibility. So some of you may be familiar, Ka uh, Carol Dweck, who's been around for many, many years, um, has, has coined this term mindset. And she, just, she defines it as a state or a frame of mind that influences your response. So Carol talks about two kinds of mindsets. There's a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Just like we were talking about with stress, stress as dilatorious and bad or stress as enhancing. A growth mindset is this idea that failure is an opportunity to grow. I can learn, challenges help me. My effort and attitude determine my abilities. Feedback is constructive. I like to try new things. Fixed mindset is much more that I'm either good or bad. I can't change how I am. I don't like challenge. I give up when I'm frustrated. Feedback and criticism are really personal and I don't like it. <laughs> and I'll stick to what I know. Now we all have both of these, by the way, right? It's rare that I come across someone who has completely growth oriented or completely fixed. And many of us have certain little areas where we're particularly a little bit more locked down and fixed. And some areas where we're, we're, we're much more open, right? So I want to be compassionate to all of us. You know, I, I think we all can continue to work on growth mindset and we can recognize there are some areas that are harder to shift. So I'm going to have us meet Carol because she is a trip. I'm going to stop sharing here. Let's see. And, oops. Go on to see Carol. So this is a brief interview with her so you can get a sense of what she's talking about. Okay. All right. So she, this is her. Some students have a fixed mindset. They believe that their basic intelligence is just a fixed trait. You have a certain amount and that's that. It makes them very concerned with how much they have. Before they do a task, they think, am I going to look smart? Am I not going to look smart? And they base their uh, activities on whether their intelligence will be shown to advantage. Other students think that's wrong. My intelligence is something that I can develop my whole life through, through passion and studying and education. So then we decided, what if we taught students the growth mindset? We developed an eight session workshop. Uh, half of the students in the study got this eight session workshop of study skills and a growth mindset. The other half got all study skills. But the study skills were great. We thought they were motivating. They did no good whatsoever. Wow. Um, to the student because they didn't have the motivation to put them into practice. For those students, their grades continue to decline. But for the students who got the growth mindset lesson, which is your brain is like a muscle, it gets stronger with use. Uh, they learn that every time they learn something new, their brain formed new connections over time. They could increase their intellectual skills. They were told. Uh, nobody laughs at babies and says how dumb they are. They just haven't learned yet. Well, they read an article about this and there was lots of discussion, heated, animated discussion. Um, and they were taught how to apply this to their schoolwork. At the end of the semester, they showed a significant rebound in their grades. And the teachers could pick out which students were in the growth mindset. Even though they didn't know. They didn't know there were even two workshops. Ross Bentley, um, kind of a world-renowned racing car coach, read my book and contacted me. He saw the connection between a growth mindset and optimal performance. Uh, these uh, top races last for, many of them last for hours. And in the course of the event, mistakes are inevitable. The difference between a winning driver and a losing driver is what you do with those mistakes. Uh, over the course of our conversations, we developed some collaborative work to see whether, in fact, 
racing drivers who have a growth mindset um, are able to enter the zone and stay in the zone even after they've made mistakes. It's so important in the business world for people at all levels to believe in growth, the growth of skills, to be able to admit mistakes and overcome them. Uh, you can't keep up with this changing world if you uh, can't grow and can't learn. So that's one very important application. But the other is you can't be a mentor, a good mentor, without having a growth mindset. And so it tells you how one group is really going around the world curious, curious to learn, and the other is going around the world wanting to feel smart. When it comes to your brain, don't lock down. Keep those neurons connecting. All right. She's got lots of other TED Talks and many, many cool things. Um, all right, so let's continue. All right, so I wanna ask you to do a little inventory. So if you have something to write with, or you can just kind of do this in your own mind's eye. I'm going to invite you to think about a time where you experienced personal growth, like a significant increase in personal growth. And as you think about that time, really ask yourself, what motivated you to really grow and learn and improve? What was the fuel? And as you think about that situation, perhaps you're touching into some of the concepts we've already talked about, that you were open, that you were willing to take a risk, that you saw it as an opportunity, that you had no other choice and you embraced it, right? You can see that you already, you know, are tapping into what we would call a growth mindset. So. You know, when Carol talked about two groups, people walking around, some groups walking around just very fixed and some, but I, I feel like we're, we're a mix of all of those, right? And I wanted you to sort of reflect on, you already have demonstrated a growth mindset probably many, many times. And just to tap into that as a touchstone as we continue to talk today. So hopefully you all were able to think about a situation um, and particularly how you were able to use it as motivation. So if we use this growth mindset idea, we know stress can help us with performance, health, learning, and growth. We can create what we call stress is enhancing mindset. This comes out of research that Carol started at Stanford University, where she's a professor now. We can look at stress as a potential for growth. That's usually not the first thing we do when we have stress. So usually we think, oh my God, I don't want this. This is, you know, this is gonna be terrible, right? But if we can begin to focus on how can we create a stress as enhancing mindset? Well, what does that look like? It would look like understanding that stress can facilitate my learning and growth. Stress can enhance my performance. Stress can improve my health and vitality. The effects of stress can be utilized, right? And at first it may be just even recognizing the possibility of this. Right? Because if we're very caught up in all the bad effects of stress, we don't even tend to think about it this way. So stress is enhancing is reflecting and using the research to really recognize it can facilitate, enhance, and improve our health. A positive stress mindset can shift and actually create different outcomes. Right. So researchers at Yale found that shifting our stress mindset from stress is enhancing versus stress is negative can improve the outcome and even create more positive ones. And when you look at people that use this stress as enhancing mindset, they have better outcomes with health, mental health, energy, and workplace performance, even when the stress is the same, right? So our mindset can affect not only how we feel, but what we do, right? 
So there is, of course, an optimal level. And this goes back to what I said in the beginning, that with too much stress, our system is going to shut down. And there's going to be a need perhaps to get mental health, to take a break, to take, you know, um, time off to, there, there are many ways that we might work when there's a lot of stress in the system, which I would call trauma, right? But under the optimal level of stress, which we might call low to medium um, or somewhere in between, we get to see performance improving. And then you can see here as stress gets too high, performance really drops. So we're talking about this sort of sweet spot where stress is low to medium um, challenge, where we can really focus our positive stress mindset. So how do we do that, right? What, um, what can we do? So we can begin by believing and really focusing on the possible enhancing possibilities of stress. And I'm gonna give you a couple of steps to do that. So we're not denying stress, but it's shifting our pendulum of awareness. What does that mean? Well, you don't think about a pendulum that goes back and forth. If our pendulum tends to go to one side, stress is terrible, I don't like this. Can we shift it to, huh, what potentially could be here to enhance my situation? So we're gonna do, talk about three steps to creating a positive stress mindset. Acknowledging the stress, welcoming the stress and utilizing the stress. So let's go into that a little bit more. So number one is to acknowledge the stress because it is real. Pretending that something's not stressful actually can make you feel worse, right? So you can pick something, you know, and we're gonna do a little experiential exercise bringing this all together. But as you look at it now, you can think about something you're stressed about. And typically we do feel worried, or we might notice your heart rate accelerates, or you might have a negative cognition like, ah, I can't handle this. Generally, we have a pattern to stress. Amy and I were talking earlier about some, some of us avoid. <laughs> we're like, ah, I don't want to do this, right? So we might avoid. That might be the way we handle it. Some people will overwork, overcompensate. Some people get angry or sad. Um, so we're not judging ourselves, but first just to acknowledge the stress itself and how it impacts us. Ignoring it or judging ourselves harshly, that doesn't actually help. In fact, that can increase the stress response. We have the initial stressor, we judge ourselves harshly, we get more stressed. So right now it's just like this general non-judgmental recommendation to acknowledge and notice how it affects you. So I might suggest saying, if I was working one-on-one -on -one with you, I might say, okay, let's acknowledge. Can you verbalize what you're stressed about? And then I might say, and how does that affect you? And that way you're just getting sort of the layout of stress. Now here's the most interesting and probably hardest part to welcome stress. And like, we're so conditioned to not welcome stress. But this, if, if you remember one thing today, um, about this presentation is this bullet here. You're stressed because you care. What does that mean? Well, if something wasn't stressed, if, if we didn't care, it would roll off us. Like, you know, when you like you're scrolling and you're reading the news and it's something irrelevant, even if it's bad news, you're like, ah, this doesn't relate to me. You know, I, I'm not interested in, um, I don't know, um, whatever, whatever the research shows. It's just not, 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 not available or interesting to me. But then you read something in the news that does relate, you know, inflation or something. You're like, oh, think about what we feel stressed about is something that we care about, usually deeply, how we're doing at work, how we're seen by other people, our relationships, our health, other people's health, the environment, the climate. We, we are stressed because we care. And that's pretty empowering in a way because when we recognize that it becomes a resource and a barometer, like, oh, this matters to me. So when someone or yourself, when you notice stress, try to remember that this is something that feels deeply important to you. In fact, when something is of value, it can help mobilize action. And so, and when we remember, oh, I care about this, that often leads us to doing an action step versus avoidance. And finally, this is a slide to show you a little bit of what happens when you welcome stress. 
it can reduce anxiety. When we welcome it, it, it helps to give us more compassion. It helps us with our health. It gives us a sense of control. Research shows when we feel like we have some control and efficacy in our abilities, we are less stressed. And it, in, it increases positive energy, right? So when we care about something and we mobilize, we actually feel better. So connecting to the underlying reason we care. And sometimes it takes a little bit of pausing to reflect. If you're anxious about starting a work project, think about what, what, what matters to me? Why is this important to me? Get really curious about what are the underlying motivations because it may end up really helping you to feel more kind toward yourself and also mobilize your attention and focus when we connect to the core reasons that something matters to us. And then finally, utilizing stress. Using a little bit of what we're talking about today, we recognize some stress, especially in that moderate level, can facilitate learning, growth, health, resourcing, and vitality. Can we harness that level of stress to improve? So what do we know? We know that when we utilize stress, it can increase performance, right? So think about, and I, I'm a runner, um, a very slow runner, but I'm a runner. And when I have no races that I've signed up for, my running gets slower and slower and slower. <laughs> and I notice I'm like, yeah, I could kind of run three miles today or four, eh, who cares, right? When I sign up for a race and I decide, okay, I'm going to do a 10K. So I got to get my mileage up. What, what, what I notice is I feel a little stressed because I don't want to embarrass myself. And it matters to me that I take care of myself and that I do well. I get a better performance, right? So that little bit of stress, signing up for the race, I notice, oh, my pace is a little faster. I'm getting myself out there on cold mornings. Oh my God, it's actually more fun because I'm starting to see my time go down. This is just a simple example. But this idea how stress can actually increase our enjoyment, our performance, and other opportunities that come out of it. So we have to have enough cog cognitive flexibility in our system. In other words, our frontal lobes have to be activated and online to actually start to look at what are some potential benefits. All right, so here's two kind of, and again, if we think about the fixed and flexible approaches to stress. Got our gentleman on the left side. This is an absolute disaster. <clears throat> I'm gonna make a total fool of myself when it comes to public speaking. Everyone will laugh at me. I'll have no credibility and my colleagues will lose respect for me. Versus our flexible, positive mindset person. I'm not a fan of public speaking, but I can get through this. Um, if I stay focused, I'll seek out tips and practice. It may not be the best, but it won't be a disaster. So that piece of... I'm going to seek out tips and practice. So she's recognizing the stress. She's naming it, why it's hard. Um, and then also recognizing that there are some ways that she can control the situation. And that even getting to the point where it might have some positive outcome. So let's do a little exercise, okay? So I am going to invite you now to think about a potential stressful event that we could use this model. And I'm gonna invite you to find something that's mild to moderate. It does not have to be the most stressful event. So take a moment to think about that. And you can write this down or just think about it. And as you think about that situation, you might even feel it in your body right now. What stress signals would you look for to recognize this situation is causing you stress? Like what are your familiar emotional, physiological and behavioral stress responses? What do you notice as you think about that stressful situation? What is it, how does it affect you? Mentally, physically, behaviorally. And then what kind of anchor or stress enhancing thought 
or behavior could help you in this situation. So maybe it's that simple reminder that I care about this or reminding yourself how staying with this stressful event could help you. So creating an anchor, sometimes it's a word, sometimes it's a visualization or imagining the outcome. Is there something that can help support you so that when you take the stressful event, you can look at it in a potentially positive way? How might this affect me? So for me, a daily anchor, like the running, right, is to remember the race. So my daily anchor is the race and crossing the finish line. That can that helps me to remember on the days I don't want to run. For lawyers, it could be simply, right, a positive outcome on a case or sensing that you've helped in some way establish justice for somebody, right? So this daily anchor, and it, it helps to plant this. So as you meet a stressful situation, you're not going to the default of, I can't do this, this is terrible, avoid, right? So this goes back to the principles we talked about earlier, right? Of naming the stress, welcoming the stress, and then utilizing some aspect of the stress to enhance and to have a positive outcome. All right, so I wanna say here, right, as we kind of come to the end, so this is an overview, it's a very general overview to really think through how we manage stress and how we potentially can harness some more flexible strategies. This by no means is a substitute for mental health, for trauma, for prolonged persistent stress, but also helps us to explore particularly these more mild or moderate chronic stressors that we can harness in a different way. So this is a little tease in some ways. I really encourage you to look at some of um, Carol Dweck's work around mindset um, and then Kelly McGonigal's work on stress, because if we can continue to be more flexible in how we approach stress, to bring compassion in to how we feel about ourselves when we're navigating stress, we begin to have a portal or a doorway to manage what's already here. We already have a lot of stress, but how can we harness it for the better? All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing here and give us some time for some Q&A. So first of all, Tracy, that was amazing. And um, again, I always learn quite a bit from you and I love being able to be a part of the uh, webinar and, and again, learning. We do have a comment from somebody saying, thank you, Tracy. This was a great review refresher for me as I sometimes, I tend to fall back into a fixed mindset when it comes to certain stressors. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it, I, I think we have to have a lot of compassion for that, that we are wired. There's an expression um, in, in psychology that neurons that fire together, wire together. So we have a stressor, we feel that tension in our body, and that becomes a little bit of a pattern. And so next time we have a similar stress, we, we kind of get into this pattern. And so well, first, I always start with compassion for that because we're just trying to navigate and these stressors come at us. Um, and then we recognize and remember, oh yeah, and I can continue to look at this in another way too. So it's it's, it's giving ourselves grace and then being able to see, is there another way I can look at this? Can I look at this as in some way, something I deeply care about? Um, you know, I think about compassion really is about feeling, um, you know, the feeling the pain of someone else, but also mobilizing and acting on it. And so that's what I think about that flexible stress response as well. Excellent. Uh, we do have another question. Sure. What's the best way to fight off the fixed mindset? Law cases can be very stressful. Yeah. I think about not fighting the fixed. You know, I, I, I feel like there's this intelligence. If we go back to really appreciating that what we are stressed about matters to us and that we are not doing anything wrong, right? So I, I want to not have the fixed be the bad and we should try to stop that, but more to understand, oh, I'm getting, you know, in a more fixed place because it is so stressful. 
um, because there are so many things that are ripping me right now. And that way we can just, we can sort of name that, not pretend that that's not there. But then I like to start with the low hanging fruit, so to speak. What is something that's mildly stressful that I can use this mindset on? Not the most stressful, but it might be just starting with a deadline, right? Something that has been a challenge. Can I take that and look at what matters to me? Do those three steps, welcome, understand why it matters. And then using that as, yeah, if I get this done, I'm going to see how I feel. Um, so I, I like to, you know, sort of have that as a more experiential exercise rather than just trying to get the mind to shift. So instead of going for the toughest challenge, you're saying maybe baby steps and start with something yeah. as a practice. It's a practice. And we are going to always go back. We, we tighten when, when there's too much stress. It's just a natural inc inclination. Our, these patterns are wired. And then and then we get to explore a little bit. So I think it like the pendulum I talked about it, earlier, we're, we're often pendulating between both of these and that's fine. That's fine. You know, we, we can't say that we're always going to be open. Um, so we get the opportunity when we get stuck, maybe to notice that and say, oh yeah, I'm getting pretty rigid here. And I notice it in myself when I get really kind of fixed to be able to pause and go, is there another way? And then reminding myself, oh yeah, I, there is another way and go through those steps again. Excellent. So we have another comment. I really appreciate this idea of facing stress as a friend rather than always painting it as an enemy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think we do have to befriend all aspects of ourselves. You know, there's a lot of research. That's a whole other topic about how, when we judge ourselves and we um, turn on ourselves, we actually increase the stress response. And so when in doubt for me, it's to be able to appreciate, wow, there's a lot of stress here. I am experiencing a lot of stress. We have another question. Um, very good one. At what point can we feel confident that what we, that we have a flexible mindset? A great question. Um, you know, and I think when we start to experience this capacity to, um, want to grow. Like, I think that's a really good benchmark when we know, like we have a situation that's stressful. We're like, huh, I'm going to look more into that. Curiosity is one of the words that comes up for me when I think about a, a flexible mindset, being curious rather than being judgmental, curious, open, um, and willing to tolerate some frustration. Those are like signs for me that we're moving mm -hmm. more toward that. Um, and having the grace when we go back to be able to recognize that too. Um, and so sometimes the ability to recognize that we've gotten into a fixed mindset reflects that we've become more, more um, open. Yeah. So another question is how about the deep distress? Will this work? Name, claim, and question mark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're beautiful. You're saying some of the same things, right? Naming it is always the beginning because when we're operating under stress and we don't name it, we put our heads down and just kind of keep our bodies, our brains, our guts, they're all getting impacted. We're, we're still reacting, even if we don't. So I love that ability. You know, I, starting to name is always a super helpful thing. Um, and so, yeah, name, claim, and question mark, I would say name, claim, and be curious. What might this point me into what direction, what opportunity might I learn from this? Um, thank you. And we have um, somebody who's looking for more tips on initial actions to take would be appreciated. One that this person uses with respect to starting a new memo is to push themselves to get a single line down on paper. And more often than not, this opens the door to continuing the task. Can you suggest others? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think you're, you know, just that idea of starting with a, a small action step. Um, when we are encountering stress, I often will do a little bit of a, a mindfulness piece too of centering, feeling in my body, noticing if there's stress. It's really hard to start something when we're already gripped. Remember how the frontal lobes are less likely to be able to do their thing, problem solve, initiate when we're under stress. We actually do better when our bodies are more regulated to be able to focus and concentrate. So if you're having trouble focusing and concentrating and then you're anxious about that, that actually makes it harder to focus and concentrate. So 
you know, being able to find at least some equilibrium so you're not coming in hot and distressed really makes a difference when you're trying to begin this process or begin to take action on something that's stressful. And you know what came to mind um, in that example you used about public speaking, where one person said, oh, it's going to be a disaster. Uh, the other person with more of that growth mindset talked about, okay, it might not be perfect, essentially, is what I took from it. And a very common trait we see in being a lawyer is that perfectionism. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that part of it, and maybe that's why it can be so this is such an important topic and people might have that fixed mindset. Yeah. Cause it, it, you know, there's so much on the line. I'm going to hear lawyers say this to me all the time. There's so much on the line. If I mess up on this case, someone could get deported, for example, right. Or something, you know, or, or millions of dollars are on the line or I could, you know, be seen in a really negative light. So it, it is true that that perfectionism, you know, is important in some ways for, for lawyers to feel like they're doing their very, very best. Um, at the same time, I think that if our system is so stressed, like I said earlier to, to Ray, it's like if, if we're so under stress, we actually um, can, you know, have the opposite effect. So I like the idea of starting with um, the idea of what can I control? When we feel out of control, that's often when we get fixed, right? So what are the, what are actionable steps? And sometimes I'll work on this with clients too. We're like, let, let's talk about actionable steps for today. And I usually don't go over three actionable steps because once we do that, we start to overload the system and we get a little bit more back into that fixed mindset. To keep our flexible mindset, we want to have a little bit more openness. So if we have three actionable steps, that can we can get that cross that off our list that allows us to stay a little bit more open. Um, so those are some some strategies. So we talk about the mind body connection. We talk about actionable steps, um, and we also talk about being able to act, to name what's happening, to name it, to acknowledge it, and to give ourselves some compassion as well. That's great. And uh, as you and I were talking about, I have um, a particular task that I've had ongoing. And um, again, I'm going to employ this and recognize, okay, I might have some stress about it, but it's okay. And I can maybe use that. And I do care about that task quite a bit. So I think that's yeah. why yeah. it's it's there. Yeah. I think, um, I think the final thing, just to thank you for sharing that piece, Amy, yeah. because it triggered this one, the kind of last piece I wanted to say is, you know, it matters. And, and, and when we're stressed about something, it's because we care, right? That kind of bullet I said earlier. And so when you get the message, oh my gosh, I'm stressed about this, really, really reminding yourself, I care deeply about this and this matters to me. And that helps too, to realign our intention and also give us maybe some motivation to recognize why this is so important. Um, so it helps to reclaim that, you know, initial reason why we're doing what we're doing. Excellent. So um, I don't see any additional questions, but I do want to remind people that if you do want to explore this with Dr. Myers a little bit more, certainly feel free to schedule a one-on-one -on -one, uh, session, uh, some time with her, as well as the other clinicians as well. And uh, thank you all so much for coming. Again, I think this is a newer idea um, although we see that the research has been, is, has been done, um, again, I think this is um, quite an exciting topic and looking at stress so differently and reframing it. Um, uh, and we do have one more comment that I want to read. Um, oh, somebody says, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tracy and Amy, excellent program. Uh, another comment, thanks so much for this presentation. Examples like the public sleep speaking panel really bring the point home. That was, it was a great example as well. So thank you again, Tracy. I have my, uh, my action steps to take and I will certainly employ that. Um, and again, thank you everybody for joining us and keep an eye out for future webinars. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Amy, thank you. Bye.